Skaino of the 50th District is here. I'm asking us all just to stand up right now. We're going to have a moment of silence. A week ago, there was a tragedy in Boston. Last week, a very serious tragedy in Texas and other tragedies that take place. It's another week that we're together. Let's just remember others at this time. A moment of silence. Thank you very much. Every day is a blessing. This is the very special Committee of Trade, Commerce, and Tourism. A special joint meeting will start shortly after this on finance as well. And I want to thank everybody here. And our uh, colleague, Mr. Rosendahl, is here shortly. But we're going to start off with item number two, just some of these routine items. And we're going to go through them. And then we're going to call on item number one in a few minutes. But let's hear for about two. Under item two, the Board of Harbor Commissioners submits for approval a proposed operating agreement with Ports America Cruise Incorporated for the operation, management, and maintenance of the Ports Cruise Terminal at berth 90 to 93. And this is for an initial term of five years with two options for renewal for a potential maximum term of 15 years. But I know Bruce, Mr. Bruce Gaino is very very much passionate about this cruise opportunity and business. Let's hear from the port real quick. Good morning. Catherine McDermott, Deputy Executive Director with the Port of Los Angeles. This cruise terminal agreement is with Ports America. It's the result of a request for proposals that we did. Ports America will operate the cruise terminal day to day, get the passengers through, handle uh, the luggage. And um, even though our cruise business is down from where it's been in the past, we, we have a reputation of having one of the best cruise terminals most efficient in the country. So we want to keep it that way. Did you see Saturday Night Live? No. Oh, oh well, I... yeah, you did miss it. They oh. opened up like they were on a cruise. Anybody see it? I don't know. How. One person saw it. Anyway, that's the ratings. Mr. Busca, you know. I think that uh, we need to uh, move forward on this item, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, obviously, the cruise terminal is not the, the biggest money maker of the Port of Los Angeles, but it's important. The tourism dollars that impact the harbor area and the city of Los Angeles, as I often say, you know, we're moving forward with LA waterfront development. Um, growing up in town, I've seen uh, passengers disembark the cruise ships, and there's buses waiting for them to go everywhere else but the harbor area. But we're, we're fixing that, and I, I'm glad to see. Uh, this item and, and this long-term lease uh, moving forward. My question, um, you know, we're, we're, we're finding efforts to modernize the uh, the airport. Um, do we have any any idea when anything in the near future of, of modernizing our cruise terminal? What's really been interesting is that um, we spent about $40 million on both um, some, some just aesthetic improvements and other improvements, elevators, HVAC. But when it came to looking at how you move passengers, we've invested in gangways. That was tens of millions of dollars in new gangways to more efficiently move the people. And secondly, um, is our permanent tent building, uh, semi-permanent. Semi right, right. and, and what we understood is that rather than doing conveyors like you do at an airport uh, for the cruise business, people just want it moves faster, more efficiently uh, just to put all the luggage down and let the passengers claim it. So we actually have a modern facility um, once we finish the improvements um, that are planned. Great solar panels as well on the roof. We, yeah, we have solar panels on the right. top. We're, we're uh, sending energy back into the grid now. Great. Our cruise uh, ships are plugging into alternate maritime power. And so um, this is one of the really efficient facilities. Great. I'm excited, Mr. Chair. Oh, the fact great. that the USSI was in place and, uh, you know, as I often say, the USS Iowa is the, uh, the staple center of our L.A. waterfront. So let's move, uh, let's move on this. Thank oh, you. Very good. I just have one question. If you're a ship right now and you're pointed towards the direction of the Pacific Ocean near the Vincent Thomas Bridge, which side is starboard, which is port? The port would be on the right side. Port is left. Very good. Uh, I got nice. it right there. Okay. All right. Very good. You got it right there. Very good. All right, Joe. We got it. on the right. I know. Port down. No, very good. We're ahead. Next item. You got to get that right. Item three. <laughs> starboard, starboard, starboard. 
So, Under uh, item three, the Board of Airport Commissioners submits for approval the fourth amendment to a lease with AMB Partners to LAX for use of premises at 11099 La Cienega Boulevard near LAX. Uh, and in this case, I believe uh, Lawa is the lessee. Correct. Yes. Very good. Your board approved it. Yes, indeed. It's a good thing for the city of Los Angeles and World Ports. This provides office space for Customs and Border Protection at the airport. Very um, key. CAO? Oh, recommends approval, yes. Good. Any questions? No questions. So ordered. Next item. Under item four, the Board of Airport Commissioners submits for approval a proposed lease and license agreement with LAX Shared Use Lounge Company. Um, and uh, this would be for development of a uh, passenger um, lounge for the premier passengers for use of the member airlines of LAX Shared Use Lounge Company and in the newly built area of the Tom Bradley Terminal at LAX. Mark Adams, Los Angeles World Airports. This is the, I believe, fifth um, uh, share, uh, lounge lease for, Brad for the new Bradley Terminal we've brought to you. We've brought the ones for the various airline consortiums. We've also brought the um, uh, one for Emirates as well. Uh, this is the one that catches all the other um, unaffiliated carriers. So it's like El Al and Ava exactly. and some of the others. Yes. And the CAO has looked at it. The CAO has reviewed this and we recommend approval. Thank you. So ordered. Next item. Under item five, the hey, Board of Airport Commissioners submits the second amendment to a contract with Aircraft Service International for maintenance and repair services for the inline baggage handling systems at LA Ontario and LAX. This amendment would extend the term by six months and increase compensation authority uh, to cover that additional time. Very good. Right. Dave Shooter, uh, Deputy Director for Engineering and Maintenance. This provides no. six more months on ASI's contract to allow the airline consortium at Ontario to take over these services. Great. And this is still, we're not. This is not the issue of Ontario and the change at all. No, it is not. Right. We got it. Very good. And uh, Gina Marie and the Commission support it strongly? Yes, indeed. Yes. CEO recommends approval? Recommend approval. Thank you very much on that item. Now we're going to go back to item number one. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Sherrod Pierce from uh, Brit Week as well as uh, Patty Majedet from the Los Angeles Tourist Board. Uh, Mr. Buscaino and uh, joining us Mr. Koretz who was in the next committee. but. Uh, the Brits several years ago, under the idea that then Council General uh, Robert Pierce, that's correct, came up with the idea to celebrate all things British in Los Angeles with the impact. Even Mulholland, who's one of my favorite of all in history of Los Angeles, has a little British head to him, although the Irish claim him, and I claim him as an Irishman, but you guys in England, you claim everybody, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Because what they did is very special, and we're going to get... Uh, some uh, of these brochures from Isaac downstairs for our guests that were here. They have events that celebrate all things British. And uh, we're going to hear a little of that from Miss Pierce. We're also having a special night for John Parkinson, who was the architect along with A.C. Martin and one other architect who designed this building right. among uh, Union Station, the Parastyle of the Coliseum, uh, Bullock's Wilshire, which is now Southwest Law, uh, Southwestern Law School, among others. Ms. Pierce, please. Uh, no, I just, if I may just butt in here for a second. Um, I just want to say I'm delighted to be sitting up here with Sharon, who um, is, is in charge of Brit Week. We've been working with Brit Week over the years and have seen it grow significantly um, each year. And as this committee well knows, um, international visitors are extremely important, and the UK is one of our largest overseas market. And it's been very effective in helping to really showcase those ties between LA and the UK. Um, all those fashion, art, culture, all those things that help really drive two-way tourism. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to thank Sharon. Thank you. Th and thank you, Councilman Labange, yes. for inviting me here today. We are so excited with uh, the launch of Brit Week starting tomorrow. It's not a week. It's actually two weeks of events throughout the city of Los Angeles and the county. Um, as uh, Tom mentioned that in 2007, Nigel Lithgow, uh, so you think you can dance, an American Idol partnered with my uh, then, not my then husband, the then Consul General <laughs> Bob Pierce. I'm still married to him. And uh, <laughs> happily, happily, yeah. I will add. 
and uh, came up with an idea to promote the synergy and the creative and innovative fusion between the UK and Los Angeles. And it's taken hold, and I hope people are aware of Brit Week. If you ride down Wilshire, Wilshire Boulevard, you'll see our banners going down the, the street. We have signs, LAX has changed their um, lights for Brit Week. Uh, there's all kinds of things going on. Uh, this is our 007 year, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, tomorrow night when we have our, cons our kickoff at the Consul General's residence, we'll have two James Bonds there, which uh, we're very pleased with, and a variety of British and American celebrities. I think the point that I'd like to make today, uh, apart from just highlighting a couple of the events, is that this truly is an opportunity for Los Angeles to showcase the city. Um, because the, the, the Brits are here in big numbers, and because the contributions, not just in the entertainment industry, but as uh, the councilman pointed out, as one of the great architects of the city, there's all kinds of opportunity throughout to do things. Uh, we are having a big uh, uh, Brit music festival in Echo and Silver Lake area, which will run several days with emerging uh, British bands along with um, some established talent in the UK, and that's uh, next weekend. We have uh, a big design icon event where we're honoring Ian Callum, the designer of JAG, that's happening this week. Um, another public-facing uh, event uh, will be our enormous Third Street Promenade uh, um, event, for which is two-day festival, um, which is May uh, 4th and 5th. Um, BritWeek.org is our website. There's about 24 different um, opportunities um, to come to public events. There's, of course, some invitation-only events as well. But um, we would encourage everybody to come and kind of springboard in this and take a look at the opportunities that we'll have for next year. City Hall, we are very, very proud of this year. And the fact that Parkinson, who is a great British architect, is being honored um, with uh, and coinciding with a brand new book that's happening on May the 1st here in the Bradley uh, room uh, at the top of City Hall. Uh, and on May the 3rd, there'll be uh, Parkinson Day. And from what we understand, Parkinson's relatives are actually coming into town for these events, which is uh, quite wonderful. So I, I encourage everybody to take a look at the Britwalk map, which gives you kind of a look of the whole city, take a look at some of the events. And um, we hope to see you out throughout these next two weeks, April 23rd through May the 6th. Thank you very well, thank much. Thank you very much. I think what's very important on the tourist board side that you recognize and realize not just Brit Week, but other very, this is one of the largest diversity uh, events where people would come to our city uh, to be involved uh, in somehow, some way. And I know just recently you were at a conference with the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce where the head of the... Uh, uh, Academy of Arts and Science was there, and the idea was that some of the seats at the grandstands for the Academy Awards be made available to promote and bring people from around the world where uh, we want to actually actively invite people. Uh, so this is good, and Brit Week is so important as we go forward on that. I, Joe, and so, and yes? Um, that is that we had, you know, in terms of media, yes, we had over close to 500 million last year. So people are watching this, not just in this area, and we've expanded too. We're in San Francisco, Orange County, and now Miami as well. So uh, kind of taking over the U.S. Great. <laughs> so that's good. We don't want you to take over, you know. You lost the war in 1776. <laughs> just for, just, for, just for, for a week. For a yeah. week. Just for a week, Tom. Just All right, we got it. We got it. Uh, Tom. Joe. Uh, Never a dull moment. Just a question. TCT. <laughs> Uh, just, I, I, I love the, uh, the map, and I just want to make this recommendation. Next year, during Brit Week, we, not, we ought to include the uh, Whale and Ale uh, in San Pedro. It's uh, an iconic, authentic pub. We'll have a San Pedro night. The so best bangers and mash in the city of Los Angeles. Andrew Silber, please be sure to include him uh, next year. He'd, I'm sure, he'd love to partake in the festivities. All right. Well, I'll make the and I'm going to give you a shot, Joe. Uh, do you know who I asked you a question about port or starboard? Okay. <laughs> now, you know who Archibald Leach was? Let me go. Oh, man. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Did I get to Google it? Yeah. Cary Grant. Okay. Oh.
So Cary Grant, they change their names. You know, they meet some agent in Hollywood. They say, your name's Archibald Leach. You're never going to work in this town. Cary Grant. So uh, the Cary Grant. So one time I'm with John Farrell at the racetrack uh, opening day. And I just got back from Hamburg. This is before there was cable television. And I saw North by Northwest. You ever see that film with Cary Grant? You've got to see it on TBS some night. Here was this guy, very famous guy. And I had just got back from Hamburg. So I walked up to him after everybody ate and told him how I saw him on TV. And he was so excited that his movies were still being... We don't realize now everything is in the palm of your hand. Back then, it was there. So there was the buffet, and there was only one lobster left. <laughs> Cary Grant served me lobster. I just wanted to tell you that, Joe. That's, good. That's item number 23 in next week's agenda <laughs> for good health and nature. Well, welcome to Mr. Rosendahl here. Mr. Rosendahl, we have done a lot of our work as we checked with your staff. I know you were uh, transcending the uh, Interstate 10 on your way in from Venice. The CAO is here. Uh, Mr. Uh, Englander, we thank you. Uh, Mr. Koretz, we thank you very much. So I think, Mr. Cook, do we have a joint committee? It's Sharon and Patty, we really thank you. Good luck at Brit Week. There will be brochures on your way out if anyone wants to see and learn. Because basically what I'd like to see this is copied by other groups uh, in our community in significance to celebrate the diversity of what is Los Angeles. So we thank that. Uh, now, that completes all our items. Uh, Mr. Uh, Rosenthal, you've been briefed by your staff. You're okay with all the other? We'll roll back. And, uh, Would you like to reconsider items two through five? And all of them and vote yes. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Reconsider. Approved for all of them. It's not a Good. All right. Now, do we switch at all? Or are we still over here on the announcement of the joint committee? It's fine. I can do it. All right. And we could call, uh, just a second, is Mr. Kokorian staff here? Mr. Kokorian staff here. Call on the telephone, 473-7002. Find out. So uh, is there any general public comment? Any complaints about the city of Los Angeles? No complaints, no comment. That's okay. We're all right. We're just waiting for the chair of the committee, Sergeant. Lisa's checking that out right now. So, anybody ride in Ciclavia yesterday? Gosh, I was the only one. I can't believe it. Two, two, three. Very good. Very good. Very good. Okay. So that's good. So we're just going to pause just for a moment. We're checking. Are they in the building? If they're in the building, we will <laughs> summon the sergeant. Lisa? Okay, we're going to get started there. We thank everybody for being here today. And uh, Madam CAO, we call this together here, the Joint Committee on the uh, Trade, Commerce, and Tourism Committee, as well as the Budget and Finance Committee of the City Council. Please. Yes, under item six, uh, you have the CAO's report concerning the proposal to privatize the governance structure of the Convention Center. Um, a, an RFP was released, and the CAO is asking for direction, policy direction, regarding the finding that the AEG facilities proposal was deemed to be non-responsive. Very good. Could I ask the CIO, Mr. Santana, and the staff, if you'd like to come forth? Good morning. Uh, Miguel Santana, CAO. I'm joined by Robin Engel, Assistant CAO, um, to seek direction on the the contract for the convention center. So on December 12, 2012, uh, your council directed us to proceed forward to release an RFP for the management of the convention center. Uh, we did so on December 21st, and um, on March 1st, we had two firms respond to that RFP. Uh, upon the initial review of the various applications, uh, it was determined that uh, the proposal from AEG did not have any of the required financial information on AEG itself. 
and the specific answer, uh, uh, the specific question was related to um, any uh, tax returns and other financial information, uh, including balance sheets from the prior three years, income statements for the for the prior three years, statements of cash flows, statements of change in the stockholders' equity for the last three years, notes to financial statements, corporate partnership federal income tax returns, credit reports, credit history, and uh, the most uh, recent quarterly financial statement. Um, we determined that there was no information provided. Instead, there was a letter indicated that AG would be more than happy to uh, discuss that matter in person. Uh, we checked with the city uh, attorney to determine how to proceed and were advised to uh, deem their proposal non-responsive for failing to submit this information. On March 18th, uh, we sent a letter uh, informing AEG that they were in fact non-responsive. And on April 11th, we received a letter from AEG disagreeing with our conclusion um, and asking for reconsideration. So that's what brings us here today. Um, the, our, our report attaches the, the letter that was submitted by AEG. They specifically say that in the context of uh, the question and answer period prior to the deadline for the RFP, there was a specific, specific question asking for clarification on what kind of financial information would be required. Um, uh, we, as a city, indicated that the city is requesting that all relevant in financial information for the entities executing the agreement as well as parent affiliates of that entity be provided. The key word is relevant. Uh, we did not know who was going to submit a proposal. We didn't know what would be relevant, so we felt that the, the bidder should determine what's relevant. And then it ha if we had any questions, we would then uh, follow up and ask, which w was permitted in the RFP. So um, there's, my office put together a team, uh, mainly made up of, of individuals from outside of the CAO to do the evaluation. They've begun that process. A final, uh, final decision has not been rendered, uh, so there's been no selection made of a vendor. Um, and so prior to any selection of a vendor, uh, we thought it was important to come to you to ask for further direction as to how to proceed. Um, and I, I recommend that you uh, defer to the city attorney in terms of what your options may be in terms of uh, possible next steps. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. But, uh, for the CAO, I'm going to start with Joe Buscaino. Thank you. Um, in, in speaking about the financial information, um, what kind of financial information was requested in this RFP and, and why is it necessary or why is it important in this specific application? So we asked, we were partnering and handing over the management of one of our significant assets to a private entity. Uh, we pay about $50 million a year of annual debt service. Any entity we do so, we want to make sure that they are in strong financial standing. And so uh, there are a number of different bidders that could have submitted a proposal. Uh, we don't want to assume anything about them. We, we evaluate their financial standing based on the specific information they give us. And as I stated earlier, ranging from their balance sheet to their credit history to their financial statements and, and um, income tax returns. So it's this, they, it, we were specific on the on the kind of information we wanted, what would be done at that point is that uh, the evaluation team would, it, would look at that information and, and determine whether or not that partner would be financially uh, stable uh, to be able to <coughs> manage his asset. Uh, our concern is always, and not specific to this one, but in general as a city, that uh, whoever we partner with uh, has the ability to fulfill their commitment as part of that contract <coughs> and looking at their financial uh, financials as part of that evaluation. Uh, okay, so the, explain to us the rules. When a firm doesn't submit financial forms, can the applicant submit these forms later? Well, each RFP is different, and in this RFP, we specifically ask for it. Um, what we, instead of reaching that conclusion independently, what we did is we asked the city attorney for a direction. Um, um, and 
it was on the advice of the city attorney that they concluded that um, because they failed to provide the information at all, there was no financial information provided outside of one letter that was about a paragraph long that stated that uh, they were not going to provide it um, due, due to confidentiality uh, matters. Um, that, that led the city attorney to advise us to deem them non-responsive. And what does a council have um, the discretion to do in this type of situation? I would defer to the city attorney for that. Well, I'm going to call on the city attorney right now, too. Uh, Mr. Echeverria is here. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Pete, for being here. So can you explain to us? Noreen Vincent, city attorney. What, what, as far as the discretion of the council moving forward? Well, the, let me just say, these situations are driven by the facts of the situation generally, and we tend to analyze them in terms of what a court would do in a situation like this. Um, there, are, there are two aspects of proposals when they're received. Either they're not responsible proposers and you don't have to even consider their, their proposals. That's not a situation here. AEG clearly is a responsible proposer. The other question is whether the, res the proposal itself was responsive to the requirements of the RFP. And what is described in the, in the CAO's report and what has been presented to us in terms of the facts is that there was a critical component of the RFP that was not responded to. Uh, the assumption, I think, that was made incorrectly is that the information could be provided at, at a later point in time. Courts apply the deadlines for RFPs and the technical requirements very strictly. And so they don't allow the discretion for a responsiveness determination to do that. So the alternatives that you have when a proposer is not responsive is to either reissue the RFP and elicit new proposals or to continue the process without the participation of that proposer, which, as we understand it, because of the capabilities and, uh, and other aspects of AEG as an entity um, and as a part of the, of the Los Angeles community, it's, it may be desirable to issue, reissue the RFP. But those are the two proposals, the two alternatives that are available. I Repeat them again succinctly. One, two. Either proceed with the proposals that are, have been received. With one, one proposal. With one proposal. Or reissue the RFP with a relatively quick turnaround. Right. And Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. The, you know, participate. Uh, relatively uh, quick meaning what? Relatively quick, as fast as the city attorneys could work and everybody else. What do you think? I, well, I would think 90 days. Oh, no, it might. It could be shorter than that. It could. All be right, I'm just telling you from my history here, but I would bet you right now it'd be 90 days, it, going through council, starting from oh. today. But that's just my bet. Yeah, I'm. I'm and focusing, I don't bet. I'm focusing yeah, okay. just on the time for I would, I would, proposals to be received. Mr. Chair, I just, I'd be on record. I hate to reissue an RFP because we need to move swiftly on this. If you look at um, the situation here, it needs to be a competitive bid. A bid, mm -hmm. uh, and you need to have two bidders. Right. Um, specifically, I mean, this is a huge undertaking here of uh, someone taking over right. and running uh, the uh, convention center. Um, I would, um, I, I, if, if you know, I'd like to move swiftly on this and, and be ashamed to start all over, especially if we don't have to, because that's what you're saying. We don't have to. No, I'm saying you do have to, yeah. or you go with the one. Or we. we oh. So you either get on the plane now and, and with let me, one ticket, or you have to go back to the counter and get two tickets. Let me point out, without going into the details of that, that I could discuss in closed session regarding potential li uh, litigation, but if there were to be litigation, the delay resulting from the litigation alone would be much longer than, even if the city were to prevail, would be much longer right. than the reissuance. All right. I, I, Mr. Buscaino, you have more questions or can we ask our colleagues from the Finance Committee? Um... I also like to hear from AEG as well, but well, we're going to call them in a minute. But I want to give you the first shot at the city staff, Mr. Koretz, and then Mr. Englander. Have we ever dealt with uh, AEG in any financial way in the past? Uh, certainly, I mean we're yeah. currently in a contractual relationship with them with an MOU for the expansion of the convention center and the establishment of a. a stadium on our convention center site through October of 2014. And did they provide their finances publicly in previous interactions with them? Uh, they weren't provided publicly, but we did have an opportunity to have our experts review their financials at that time. And so we knew from our previous interactions with them 
that they wouldn't provide these publicly, but they would provide them privately? Well, I couldn't, we weren't in a position to assume anything because they're, they're, AG is a multifaceted organization and um, the specific entity that submitted a proposal is different than the entity that we are partnering with. So uh, it's because of that complexity that we sought advice from the city attorney because that's the first thing I thought of, uh, frankly, when we received, when I was informed that they did not submit the financial information was in fact because we currently have a, a different kind of contractual relationship with them could that process uh, satisfy um, this requirement? And um, uh, I was advised that, in fact, it could not. I think what I'm asking is probably the reverse, which is we've had experience with them before. So would we not have been able to assume that they would not provide their um, financial records publicly but would only do it privately as they had in the past? The, the difference here is that um, this is a competitive process. Uh, we did not engage in an RFP for the, our partnership with them as it relates to the stadium and the expansion of the convention center. So, you know, we set a, a series of, of expectations in the RFP process, no different than any other RFP. And it was actually our expectation that all the bidders would, would f meet those, those expectations. Uh, how problematic do we think it is if we do this with only one bidder? You know, it, it, it's always better for the city to have competition, uh, and as a as a general rule, I think that's that certainly. Um, I am concerned about um, spending more time uh, trying to reach a conclusion. Uh, the convention center is, um, frankly, um, has experienced some decline as a result of the discussion of the privatization of the operations. People are leaving the convention center today. Uh, and seeking other employment within the city family. So the number of personnel has dramatically dropped over the last several months. Um, a prolonged discussion uh, would obviously make that a greater challenge. So uh, I hope today that there would be some resolution to figure out how to proceed. Um, you know, I think competition is always a, a good thing, and I, when I asked the city attorney for direction, I asked that from the perspective of hoping that the answer would be uh, we could basically still have as many competitors as possible. Uh, that was not the answer I received, and so proceeded with the advice that I was given. Now, I, I've heard that it's been suggested that uh, we give the responders to this a chance to uh, provide some supplementary information and, and update their proposal and, and that that could be done with both responders. Is that a, a possibility legally? No, if, if I may take a second to respond. When, uh, Noreen, Vincent, Noreen Vincent, first hired under Mayor Bradley's administration, <laughs> great city attorney. Um, in, in looking at the RFP, what the city puts into the RFP are uh, requirements that we impose, impose on all of the entities that are responding. In this particular case, we had a provision that required that certain financial information be provided. And it was worth, the evaluation of the financial information was worth 25% of the overall scoring. Um, we, we had uh, pre-bid conferences. We uh, provided opportunities for any bidders, or interested bidders, to ask questions, to respond uh, to anything that we had in the RFP. And it's my understanding that at no time did AEG raise this issue, that they had concerns about providing this type of private financial information. The, the, this particular RFP and the responses need to be evaluated without regard to what other information, what other outside information we may have about AEG uh, in order to be fair to all of the proposers. So in, in looking at the response, AEG did not provide the requested information and furthermore actually told the city that they were not going to provide it. So they, in a sense, told us that they were going to be non-responsive. Uh, once the, Did they that, not tell us that they'd provide it privately? But, but that was not what we asked for. We, we didn't provide an opportunity for them to tell us or give it to us at a later date. We requested that it be provided to us when the proposals were due. 
and indeed it was not. So what I... What was their answer for that? The, I have... We, I'm a little more liberal. Yeah, well, they, <laughs> I guess this is the, um, the answer that... Uh, well, I, when did the dissenters come in, correct? I mean, there... No, this is, the, this is what was actually in their letter. Uh, well, it said that they were a, pre a privately held company, do not release financial information. However, company management is willing to meet with city representatives to review and discuss such financial information and our financial sustainability. But, but, but that is not the same as actually providing the information and the material that we asked for right. in the time frame. And, and if I may, we're, we're in, in the midst of a, a competitive process at that point, so that it, it's, it's like a runner saying, well, you know, I can't run the race at 10 o'clock, but I'll run it at 10.30, and you can time me then. It, it just doesn't comply with the rules that apply to that competitive process. And again, there, there are alternatives available, but there are limited alternatives. Mr. Correct, anything? If I, uh, if I could clarify. Mr. One. Yeah, I'm going to keep it on back to Mr. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Correct. Speak Last question, and whatever you're going to clarify, maybe you can throw it in. But uh, the question is, what do you recommend as the CAO? I, w I didn't see a recommendation. Um, well, I was going to clarify that uh, last week we did actually receive uh, financial information uh, or a box that indicates that there's financial information in it from AEG. We have not opened that box pending uh, direction from your committee. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult answer because as a general rule, it is always more effective for the city to have competition. It, it, it doesn't matter if we're buying pencils or, or you know, engaging in and purchasing other major services. Uh, and so, I think having competition would be the most effective way to proceed to allow an evaluation. However, uh, we have to be respectful of the process, and so that's why I defer to the city attorney as to what the options are. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Koretz. Mr. Englander. Yes. Thank you, Mr. LaBonge. Um, just to dive into this a little deeper, if I could, and going through a lot of the correspondence uh, from your office, Mr. Santana, uh, and looking at the historic actions uh, that this body has taken in the past as it relates to what the Charter allows and setting aside certain requirements of RFPs, particularly financials, as we did for all tech as well when we ran into a similar situation. So we've, we've done that before. But in going through this, and it sounds like the dialogue is a little different than the, the, the paperwork and the record from, from my perspective and just what I'm reading in black and white. And maybe that's my takeaway from it. But in looking at this, there was a communication to um, your office, Mr. Santana, on April 11th. Um, and it wasn't a one paragraph. It was a four-page letter. Are you familiar with that letter? Yes, I, I am. And we attached it to our report. That's where I got it, from your report. So, okay. So with that, though, it, it, it spells out the fact that they believe uh, the RFP was uh, unambiguous or was ambiguous, was unclear. Um, it, it, in fact, a lot of the responses uh, back to them only served to induce greater ambiguity. Uh, the question was that the, they were asking the proposer and its parent affiliates for all financial information from all their entities uh, rather than perhaps specific ones here locally or ones that would be operating and narrowing that approach. They explained um, that that was excessively burdensome and highly inefficient. Uh, they on, went on further and got into even greater detail, um, stating that they would uh, provide additional uh, documentation. They alluded to the fact that it was a response from the city at some point that it would be a bid enhancement if we asked for these technical changes if for their financial information. Um, but yet we've done it in the past. It sounds like it's more clarification than an enhancement from, from what I know we've done in the past. Um, and we have a, a precedent on that. And, um, and my concern is, and then they go on further and, and close with the fact that they would provide uh, information as it pertains to um, this RFP since the information has gone back and forth with a little more clarity. With that, it doesn't sound to me as um, we would have to do one of, we've got the third option as well. And not the only two options wouldn't be simply to throw it out and start over with an RFP or go with one bidder. And I, 
what you said earlier, uh, Mr. Santana, is you're absolutely right. I don't think it's just in the city's best interest to only have one bidder on any RFP, um, whatever that might be. Uh, we should always have as many as possible, quite frankly, for, for so many obvious reasons. Um, otherwise, uh, things will, will certainly uh, escalate financially in terms of the cost and operation. This, is, this RFP is critically important, and I think it was said earlier. Uh, we've been talking about this for years. It was Mr. Perea Bossi, who was the former general manager, in fact, that said because of the restraints we have within the city, it's very difficult to negotiate and have the same timelines uh, to try to attract certain conventions, and there's reasons we have to do this. And so I'm delighted to hear that we've gone as far as we have. It sounds like this is some minor technical information, and it's sort of being blown out of proportion for whatever reason. I think the extra um, legal scrutiny is good. It's always good uh, to keep us out of uh, the courts. But to me, from everything I've seen and read, um, that the RFP, there were some things that probably should have been written uh, slightly differently with a little more clarity, particularly if you're getting um, a company that's coming in that's been very public, in fact, that they were uh, on, the, on, the, on the block for sale at one point and taking it back. And, and we can certainly understand um, perhaps some reasons for <clears throat> not wanting full disclosure on all of their assets and properties and various interests uh, since it is a multifaceted faceted organization. Uh, that has a lot of interest worldwide. That would certainly make reasonable sense. Um, and so if there's a way to, for the council to instruct or this committee to instruct uh, what we've done in the past based on the charter and make sure we do it in a transparent form and fashion, uh, I would certainly be supportive to have that ability to have uh, at least a couple bidders that we can begin negotiating with and, and reviewing it from that perspective. Thank you. Mr. Jingler, thank you. Mr. Rosendahl. Yeah, I just want to say, Mitch, you're fantastic. To the microphone, Mr. Rosendahl. You're Mr. To the microphone. I just loved the way you captured it all. Captured it all. Thank you. You really did. Uh, he did a great job on that. Uh, folks, look, uh, Ted Chung is running around in the elevator from NBC. Wants to know, budget committee today. Budget committee today. Uh, Well, this is the budget committee right now, preempt. We make this thing happen, and we go forward with There'll be a revenue stream, a significant revenue stream. It's a no-brainer that somebody within this process, I mean, AEG is like bringing the elephant in the room and saying, oh, I have a mouse. I mean, it's a giant outfit. And they have more to gain downtown and more to lose if it doesn't go downtown than anybody else. So it's a win-win. So it's a no-brainer for me, but the process is important. City attorney's got to be right. We don't need no lawsuits. We don't need anybody fighting against it. All we need is that competitive bidding in place, and we just need this to go forward in the quickest possible way. We'll listen to all the speakers. I don't know if anybody's going to say anything different than this, but frankly, I want to speed it up. I want to get AEG in the process, and I'll get on with it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosendahl. Uh, Mr. Kokorian, thank you for joining the committee, and I know you had work with the mayor on releasing the budget. Uh, comments, please. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Lebanj. I, you know, I think this is a pretty straightforward question that's before us uh, right now. It's, it's really not a question of whether AEG is a good bidder or not. It's not a question of whether the uh, anyone is a good bidder or not or a likely fit. It's simply a question of should the city have more or fewer options and um, what, are, what are the legal constraints in our achieving more options, which I believe is the way we want to go. We want to have the greatest degree of consideration uh, for the greatest number of options to just discern what is in the city's best interests. So, um, it, you know, it, in my view, we, unless there is um, a stronger case than I've seen that we would be mandated to maintain the position that uh, one of the bidders was non-responsive, I would prefer to consider the bids on the merits. Thank you very much, Mr. Kokor. And we do have cards at this time. I'm going to have one minute public comment. If you can't say it one minute, I'll give you a little extra time. Uh, but uh, we like to hear from you right now. Uh, see, I know. Thank you very much. Ted, uh, Ted, if you could come up first. Bob Newman, Bill Delvac, and then I want to start right here. Irene Lewis, who's a superstar. Irene Lewis. 
So if she's still here. All right, those are the first four speakers. Honorable Council Members, Bill Dalback on behalf of AEG, we appreciate the Council's attention. The Charter is clear. The people in writing the Charter said that the City has the right to waive any informality in submission of a bid when it's to the advantage of the City. It is clearly to the advantage of the City for two bidders. AEG submitted a proposal of over 1,300 pages. It was clear from the beginning that it would provide financial information. The form in which it provided it was to ask for an opportunity to protect the confidentiality, and we appreciate the Council noting that the proposal was submitted at a very delicate time with regard to financial information. And so the form of submission is what's at stake here, and the Charter is clear. You have a right to waive the form. Uh, your CAO uh, quoted the language about the addendum that stated about the financial information. The, the addendum says relevant financial information for affiliates. It doesn't say financial information for relevant affiliates. We believe that the RFP was ambiguous, and our way of addressing that was to provide a letter saying, if you will meet with us, we will provide the information. We urge you to waive this informality. Thank you very much. The next speaker, Ted, if you would for the, state your name for the record, please. Ted Fickray, uh, Vice Chairman, AEG. We, while I'm here to advocate on behalf of AEG, I, I, I could say that we, we felt strongly that what's in our interest here is clearly in, in the city's interest. We're, we're not seeking any favoritism or special treatment. We just want a chance to compete for this. Uh, we're confident, given the opportunity, that we will demonstrate to the city that AEG is the best option here. We have, a, as, as was alluded to earlier, we have a track record of successful execution here in Los Angeles with a number of public-private partnerships with the city of Los Angeles. We have complementary assets at LA Live and Staples Center that not only uniquely situate us to d deliver but align our interests in a way that we think uh, yeah, put us in a unique position to attract additional activity to the convention center. And we're confident that we have the resources and capability to significantly improve the performance of the convention center. Our, our view is the, city the city's interest cannot possibly be furthered by allowing a technical issue to dictate an outcome and one where a single bidder would be handed a contract by default rather than having to compete on the merits of their proposal. We feel the decision should be based on substantive considerations like the fee proposal, track record, and alignment of interest. For, so, for those reasons, we urge you to try to find a way to take action here that would enable us to have a chance to compete for this contract. Thank you very much. Mr. Newman. Bob Newman, uh, President of AG Facilities. Thank you for the time this morning. Uh, just want to, you know, we operate, uh, we're the facilities division, the bricks and mortar division of AG, all the venues, and uh, operate on five continents. Uh, we truly, truly wanted to express our unwavering commitment to support the operations of the Convention Center here in Los Angeles. Uh, the competitive bid structure that the city has set up is, is one that we're very used to, one that we've participated in many other cities, and we appreciate the need for full compliance, and we feel we're headed on that track. Uh, in preparation of the document, you know, we, you'll see a, a lot of our, our resources are committed 100 percent to the city. Uh, the city here is a unique moment in time to really elevate itself, not just on a regional or national basis, but on a global basis. And that, you know, that fits our model. That's why we're, you know, we're 100 percent committed and, and not conflicted in, in pursuing this agreement. Thank you very much. And the next person I want to just introduce, uh, Irene Lewis, who's the head of the Red Shield, the Salvation Army, for over 20 years has been an angel uh, organizing and for young people in the Pico Union area. And uh, uh, several years ago, the late great Hugh Hauser did a special on Irene and the work of the Red Shield. And a rancher who's up in Paso Robles sees it on a statewide PBS and sends a million dollars to help further the cause. This is very special. I just had to, every time I see you, and I spoke about you yesterday at a community meeting, so there's a, the circle be unbroken. Irene, go ahead, please. Irene Lewis, Executive Director of the Salvation Army Red Shield Community Center. I'm here to really ask for you to consider um, allowing AEG to be part of the bidding process. I say this because as a nonprofit, we have submitted proposals to the city for funding. And as a nonprofit, they receive hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of proposals. And so sometimes there are little issues that are um, booted out because of technicalities. But we're talking about a company who's responsible, who cares about the city, who cares about the people in the city, and also who have not just one 
owner, but many, many owners. So I think that it would be a devastation if you didn't consider them and allow them to bid. We need two bidders. We need competition. It would be devastating for the city, for loss of employment, city revenue, and not only that, but really strengthening community agencies and those that are on the front line work needing that support. Thank you very much. Keep up your great work. Uh, the next four speakers, for, uh, Priscilla Chin, Francis Vega, uh, Tommy Feva, if I said that right, Tommy? I didn't. Favai. Uh, and then Amanda Irving. Amanda Irving, please. Okay, I got to get glasses. <laughs> <coughs> sorry, Frank. Okay, either way. Whoever. Good morning. My name is Priscilla Chang, Economic Development Director for the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor, representing hundreds and thousands of workers throughout our city and region. Tourism is one of the largest industries for Los Angeles and supports over close to 400,000 jobs. Of the 41.4 uh, million visitors that come through our region, many come through our convention center, which supports hundreds of good union jobs, like trade show and construction workers, janitors, support staff, food and beverage workers, stagehands, and grips. Many who are joined uh, with us this morning. It is wrong, and maybe I'm just pre maybe I'm preaching to the choir this morning, but it's wrong for us to give away the management of our convention center without a fair and competitive process. Anything short of that is not in the best interest of our city and working families. AG is the only better in this process that has a track record and proven ability to get things done. We've seen this time and time again through the complete transformation of the downtown region. AEG brought us a Staples Center, LA Live, and even a Stanley Cup championship, all through good union jobs. They have brought us world-class enter uh, entertainment and sports facilities, and they will help make our convention center a World Cup facility as well. We strongly, strongly encourage you to include AEG in the bidding process for the convention center. Not only will they make this a fair and competitive process, but they will and continue to be the best choice for our city. Thank you very much. Tommy. Thank you, committee members. Uh, my name is Tommy Favai. I represent International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 11 in Los Angeles. And I'm, I'm here to stand before you uh, to support uh, AEG and bringing them back into the bidding process. Uh, we urge you to waive the inform informality uh, that has uh, become to the staff to look forward to. Um, and we urge that uh, we support our partners here with AEG, because AEG has been a, a partnership with the city for many years when it comes to labor, nonprofit, you name it, in the community. So we need to see AEG back into the process so they can bid on this competitive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Franco. I'm going to speak from the heart. Uh, five years ago, I created an employment center on Skid Row at the Midnight Mission. AEG took my call and hired my people off Skid Row. We know that population. Two years ago, I received another call to start another foundation to focus on employment for foster care youth. I accepted the challenge. I called AEG one more time, and Martha and Joe Herrera said, yes, we'll hire your foster care youth. Seventy percent of the kids, uh, seventy percent of the people who go through prison come from foster care youth in the state of California. That's not a lie. Eighty percent of the girls walking the streets prostituting or sex trafficking come from Department of Children and Family Services. That's not a lie. So if I lose this or we lose this relationship uh, with AEG, where's my foster kids going to go? There's no one fighting for my foster kids, but AEG has been a partner of ours. They keep hiring my people. So that's all. I, I just wanted to speak from the heart. I support this. Please allow AEG to be a part of this RFP process. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you. Amanda Irving. Hi, Amanda Irvine, South Park Community Benefit District bid. I'm here representing the districts and the property owners, businesses, and residents of South Park, which is uh, 32 square blocks in the southwest corner of downtown LA. The Convention Center and AEG's current facilities are within our district, and I wanted to let you know that on January 14th our board, at our board meeting, the board voted to support AEG's bid to manage the Convention Center. So we're here today to support their bid to still be considered and um, keep the bids competitive. Don't want to waste your time with more repeats. AEG is great. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, Chris Harmon, Daniel Machada, is that correct, Daniel? From United Way. Stuart Waldman from VICA. And Jessica Duboff from the Chamber. You can start. Good morning. My name is Chris Hannon. 
I'm a council representative of Los Angeles Orange County Building and Construction Trades Council. I'm part of the coalition of city unions. We represent 140,000 members, over 52 uh, affiliated unions for 14 trades. This includes the hardworking building trades members working for the city of Los Angeles at the convention center. LA has put a lot of years of investment and energy into revitalizing the downtown. The city has done a fine job running the convention center and now that we are seeing signs of economic recovery, it doesn't make sense to hand over one of LA's potentially most valuable assets to a single bidder. People get multiple bids to fix their cars, to fix their houses. To give away a core asset to a single bidder with no competition and little transparency is just wrong. It is not in the best interest of the people of Los Angeles and shouldn't be tolerated. It makes common sense that we should take enough time to get the best deal for our city now and in the future. The process should be slowed down and bring in all stakeholders to develop a plan for the best of all Angelinos. Thank you. Thank you very much. David. Yes, good morning. Uh, David Menchaca with United Way of Greater Los Angeles. Uh, thank you very much for hosting the session this morning. Um, uh, AEG is the gold standard when it comes to providing uh, resources to our community. Uh, they have by far set a new standard of, of how to uh, engage and entertain and, and, and help our community. Um, we believe they are by far the best choice to manage and operate the convention center. Uh, they do things on, on such a high level uh, with all of the people that come to Los Angeles. Uh, I would trust AEG to make sure that they provided our tourists and visitors with the best possible experience uh, when it comes to safety, when it comes to all of the details, when it comes to just creating that experience for people to come to Los Angeles. I would trust AEG to be able to deliver that quality experience to ensure that people come back to Los Angeles and spend their hard-earned dollars in our community where it's needed most. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Say hello to Elise Buick from all of us. You got it. Stuart. Hi. Stuart Waldman. I'm president of the Valley Industry and Commerce Association, VICA. Uh, we have over 380 business members who've created over 100,000 jobs in the city. Uh, we care about jobs, and we believe that the revitalizing the convention center will create jobs, uh, will have a huge financial impact to the city, and we care about the process, and we think having only one bidder on, in this process is not the right way to go. It will uh, lead to heightened scrutiny on uh, how the decision's made. Uh, so we want to make sure that there's more than one bidder here. That's Thank all. you. Good morning. Yes. My name is Jessica Duboff. I'm here on behalf of the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber has been a longtime supporter of the plan to hire a private operator for the Convention Center and to operate the asset as a public-private partnership. We believe focusing on core public services and pursuing creative management and operational partnerships is vital to the city's economic health. That being said, we do not believe it is in the best interest of the city to have only one bidder on such a significant contract. This process has a precedent for how Los Angeles will move forward on public-private partnerships for non-core services, and we would like to ensure that the process is done in a fair, competitive manner. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next four speakers, David Henderson, Molly Rhodes, Samara Davis, and Joe from the search to involve Filipino-Americans. Forgive me for not reading your... Yeah, well, that's better than that. That's good than that. Thank you. How do you pronounce your last name, Joe? Saint Jacinto. Salamat. Good morning. David Henderson, uh, business rep with IUPAT, District Council 36, and trade show installers locally 31. Um, council members, we believe that there needs to be competition. So we would respectfully request that the committee reconsider and allow AEG to be part of the RFP process. We also believe that AEG's past history with Los Angeles is second to none, and that, that, that would make them the best fit for the day-to-day -day operation of the Los Angeles Convention Center. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Molly. Hi, my name is Molly Rhodes. I'm a research analyst with SEIU 721 and uh, work with the Coalition of Unions. Um, I just want to say that I think the problem in front of us today is totally predictable um, and it's an outcome to a rush to a privatization. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that 
I'm, I'm not ordinarily happy with what the CIO does, but private corporations must know that transparency is the price of doing business in this city. We can't just give away assets. Um, that said, RFPs have to be done the right way so that people know what the rules are. This RFP was not done the right way. Council didn't vet the final RFP language. I hope you never do that again. Um, and the CAO office rushed the RFP in an unheard of four-week timeline. That's not how competing cities handle their convention center assets. And it's not a recipe for a public process. So thank you. Thank you very much, Molly. I'll be a little softer than that. <laughs> Shamari Davis, IBW, Local 11 Business Rep. Um, I must say it was uh, great to see Councilman Buscano and, Bus and Councilman Englander up in Washington doing great work for Southern California on the Hill. Um, with that, I said, was there too. You didn't see me. I missed you. So I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't see you I didn't. We didn't see Tom. I don't know. Big, 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 big. <laughs> I just go to who I saw. Uh, we just want to say that uh, IBW has was. Um, I've had some great history with AEG. Um, coming on staff, I did LA Live, which was an incredible project. I remember when it was just a parking parking lot, and now it's an incredible, credible. Um, destination for the city of LA um, and we want to continue that kind of exclusive partnership with AEG they they believe in working families they believe in union which means uh, the um, definitely working families can continue to be viable here in the city of LA and because of that partnership we're able to hire foster kids to be career electricians to have career um, viability in here in the city of Los Angeles so we encourage that we believe in fair competition our contractors do it all the time um, we fairly compete so that we can make sure we build it right the first time and we believe AEG um, would be a viable candidate for the city of LA please um, consider them Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, council members. My name is Joel Jacinto. I'm the executive director of Search to Involve Filipino Americans, or SIPA, in historic Filipino town. We're just about within the three-mile radius of uh, the convention center, and I've been there for 20 years. Our organization has been around for 40 years. And I'll speak to the, to the issue of community engagement. I've been working with Martha uh, and her staff and her team uh, for almost seven years. Martha Saucedo. Uh, for almost seven years. And reaching out to diverse communities uh, in this important project not with uh, the Staples Center and with Farmers Field is an extremely empowering for a community and organization that really just gets overlooked. It's important to note that Filipinos are the largest Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander group in the city. So to be welcomed and to be engaged um, uh, makes us realize that we have a future in partnership with AEG. And from today, I'm already planning uh, the week in the Philippines. Uh, we're going to work with the AEG to have that there as well. So I urge you to reconsider and keep them in a bin. Yeah, very good. Thank you so much. The uh, last two cards that we have would be uh, Maria, and I want to pronounce your last name correctly, uh, Benistos, is that correct? Okay, she's coming right now. And also James Elmendart, is that correct? Elmendorf. Elmendorf or Elmendart? Elmendorf. Elmendorf. What was his number? The, uh, David, uh, what was David Elmendorf's number who played for the Rams? Play outside linebacker for the Rams in 1970s. Yeah, what was his number? Oh, I have no idea. 42. Very good. Yeah, all right. So Jackie Robinson's good. number, right? Yeah, you got it. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Who was that? Good idea. Go ahead, Maria. Very good. Well, uh, Maria, go. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. My name is Maria Buenrostro. That's how you spell it with the rolling R. But thank you. And I have worked at the Los Angeles Convention Center for 21 years. I'm here with representing 500 food and beverage workers who work at LACC. We have good jobs and good paying benefits at the convention center right now. Our job is important to us because we all need good health benefits and that's what they offer now. We are concerned about the changing, the changing happening at the convention center. We want to make sure that our good jobs are protected, we ask you to ensure that there's a fair process choosing a new company to, to run the convention center, like AEG. We do not want a worker-friendly company to be thrown out on, in a, on a technicality. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. 
Okay. Good James. morning, Council Members. James Elmendorf from Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy. I, I'm here to uh, support, as Council Member Englander said, the third way. I uh, strongly believe that competition is important not only for the city, but also for the thousands of workers who uh, both work directly at the Convention Center and benefit from the Convention Center. Uh, competition is essential to ensure that they can continue to have good jobs in the tourism industry, that workers like uh, Maria, uh, some of the five to 600 workers uh, in the concessions uh, operation of the Convention Center can have good jobs. It's not uh, a good option to allow one company, a mostly non-union company, to come in, uh, particularly when we have a company that has a long track record dedicated to quality jobs here in Los Angeles, has demonstrated its financial viability to the city over and over again. Um, we know that the city has the opportunity uh, to allow both companies uh, to address the form in which they submit uh, their financial viability uh, records. Um, we would urge this council to be able to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, James. That completes it. Uh, Mr. Kokorian, I'm going to call on first, then followed by Mr. Buscaino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to um, briefly comment because a lot of the public comment uh, seem to be going in the direction of uh, talking about AGs on AG on the merits, and so I just wanted to bring it bring the question back home for us and remind uh, my colleagues that the issue before us has nothing whatever to do with whether AG is good or bad, a great corporate citizen that contributes to charities, or an evil nemesis. It has nothing to do with that at all. The question before us is a very simple one. AEG has submitted a bid. Do we want to look at it or not? That's the only question before us. Uh, it might be a good bid. It might be a terrible bid. But we won't know until our skilled, capable staff evaluates it. That's all. The only question before us is whether our city staff should consider two bids or one bid. Um, they will then report back to us and make their determination in their rankings. So um, it, this, there's a very narrow question really before us, and that is whether the bid that was submitted by AEG um, was sufficient to meet the requirements uh, for waivability of technical defects. That's it. Very good. Pete, did if you have I may, <coughs> If I may, Pete Echeverria from the City Attorney's Office. It, it, yes, it is, it is a straightforward question. Uh, it's a question of responsiveness, uh, not just responsibility. And it's not a question of whether the city wants to proceed with it, but it's a question of what ultimately a court would do looking at it to determine whether or not this was a requirement, an express requirement of the RFP that was not complied with. And in that respect, uh, we believe that it, that it was not complied with. The CAO did a very good job of laying that out in the report. The fa it's fact-driven. Um, it's, it's more than a technicality in our view. And uh, as I offered before, we'd be happy to discuss the, the potential legal ramifications of litigation in this context in a close session if you care if to we so choose. And have that discussion. Right. Mr. Bruce Cayo. Well, uh, Pete, if I, if I can keep you here. where you are. Thank you, sir. City Charter Section 31, I'm sorry, 371, subsection C, mm -hmm. states the city has a discretion to waive any informality or proposal when to do so would be to the advantage of the city. How can we... And so we, have a, we have a lot of experience in, in numerous other contracting processes where technicalities do in fact arise or informalities arise. Uh, uh, for example, if a form is executed that needs to be signed, is it signed? Can that be, can that occur? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an informality, a technicality, especially when the proposal itself is signed. There are technicalities and informalities that arise. Um, there, it's always a factual question, and there, there may be a judgment call involved, and this, from what we've seen in decades of experience, this is not a, just, just a technicality or a factual question. It's as not whether or solely not. a technical requirement. It's more than they, that. They fail to provide a clear, express direction, if you will, a requirement. So it's my understanding that AEG provided, provided a CAO with a box, a box that after the fact. After the fact. And, and remember, these, these are competitive processes. Everybody has to be treated the same way. Therefore, the deadline applies. So if the information is provided after the deadline, then, then the determination has to be made, is the information that's provided and viewing of the information, is that an enhancement of the proposal? Not that it makes them any better proposer, but whether the proposal that received has somehow been made better by providing the information that was not provided before. So would it be your, your suggestion to direct the CAO to open the box and uh, come back to this committee? 
No, my, my suggestion would be to direct the CAO to reissue the RFP with any clarifications that the CAO believes are needed or council yeah. believes are needed and to get proposals uh, from whomever, including AEG, within a matter of, uh, say, three or four weeks. So, mem members, around. I'd like to suggest that if we are going to question the city attorney about the bases for the city attorney's uh, legal advice or uh, potential ramifications of that advice, that we do that in closed, closed session, given the uh, potential exposure that might arise one way or the other. Um, so I, I would suggest, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, that, that discussions and any anything supporting what the city attorney has to say should be reserved for, for closed session. Absolutely. Oh, and while I, while I have the microphone, I just also want to announce that uh, the separate Budget and Finance Committee a meeting that we'll be having at the conclusion of this discussion is, looks like it's going to be delayed a bit because I see that Mr. Geis and I think others were here, so we'll probably begin that maybe around noon. All right, let me just ask the questions. Any other questions, uh, Mr. Uh, Englander? Just an observation and a quick statement, if I could. And I'd like to thank the city attorney for providing the legal analysis and their opinion as well. Um, and for the most part, for the majority of the time, uh, we consider it and take it. Um, and then sometimes we don't. Uh, in fact, we've been through a situation on a particular issue that uh, was a big one, uh, where we as a council decided not to go with the city attorney opinion. Um, it ended up in litigation and we won um, all the way to the Supreme Court. Not that this would go <laughs> that far and this is anywhere near something like that. But it was, uh, uh, there's been quite a number of cases just to put on the record that it's an opinion by our council in-house to us. Not, it's not a binding legal decision and it's certainly not one uh, that directs us in any one particular action. It's strictly a yeah. attorney-client opinion right. uh, at that. And so uh, with that, again, going through uh, the history of where we've been on this, and I, and I want to thank also uh, Mr. Kokori, and I think what you said, and you're very articulate, was absolutely 100% correct and, and uh, spot on. Uh, the message is that this decision today before us has nothing to do with it might as well be a blank name. AEG is irrelevant in this. It's a matter of following protocol. Do we want to have and and and, uh, uh, and what the charter allows and how we view this as a technical decision? I think we've got to take the totality of all the conversations and dialogue into consideration, uh, not just the simple black and white version of what was stated at the opening and that they didn't submit and failed to submit. Uh, this proposer actually explained um, that it was vague of what was being asked. It was ambiguous. Uh, it was a bur burden in terms of what types of documentation they've narrowed in on from further discussions with direction from our own CAO, uh, what that information should be, and then provided the information. Do we allow it for the box to be open or go through you know, another three weeks of a lot of staff time? And uh, whether and, and just for clarification, this wouldn't, this wouldn't kick out the other bit we would still have the two if we allowed us to move forward on this, what I would consider technical change. Is that correct? Technically, we only have one bid right now that we feel that right. the city attorney likes. Correct? Okay. Let me just ask this question. Members, do you have any general questions or do we, we're going to go into executive session? Yeah. Mr. Rosendahl? Yeah, first of all, I don't think we need to go into executive session, but out of respect for one of my colleagues who wants to ask some questions, obviously I'll support it. But you basically said that you could issue another RFP in three or four weeks we could be back at square zero, we could evaluate the process, and we could make a decision. Correct. Okay. So if, if we in closed session uh, discuss this, no matter where we discuss it, your bottom line is you could issue another RFP and that would put it all out there again. But Correct. I think, I think that there's some interest in having some greater analysis of the sure. reasons for that. But that, that's your bottom line. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so with that being said, I'd like to ask uh, Sergeant if there's a room that we could go to, because everybody's here instead of having everybody leave here, that we could go to, because there's uh, seven or ten of us or whatever it is, Mr. CAO, we go to re and then we'll come back, we'll have our little executive session. Mr. Kikor, do you feel comfortable on that? Sergeant, do you have a key to one of the uh, rooms? Back here. Yeah, right back here. Right, right back here? Right in, the back. right in the back. So we'll do that. Everybody stay here. It'll probably be 10 minutes. For those of you who've never visited Tom Bradley Tower, you go to the top, look at the view. It's worthy. And, and we, we will... Uh, Mr. Announcement, uh, Madam right, CAO, 
The committee will be recessing into closed session pursuant to government code section 546 Very good. Uh, D.2. Yes. Well, 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 to discuss the, the, the legal issues that presented by the situation at hand uh, and the potential for litigation and uh, we provided advice and so now it would be appropriate for the committee to deliberate or make any motions. Correct. And uh, Mr. Uh, City Clerk for taking the record. You're prepared and ready? Yes, I'm ready for the recommendation. For, uh, if the recommendation is chair I make uh, and we could discuss it but that we reissue the RFP for the issue we resolved that here's before us. I'd ask the CAO to give general comments of that action. Um, under that scenario, I would recommend that it be reissued as soon as possible after your full council take action. So uh, in addition to that, we would um, also recommend if the city attorney concurs that all the current uh, proposals be kept confidential uh, and, um, and that would there be a period of time that's uh, equal to the original RFP or similar to the original RFP for other respondents to submit proposals. Which is a 30-day period from when council takes its action. Thank you, Mr. Kukoy. Well, and there was a reference to existing proposals. Yes. Those proposals that were submitted, whether deemed responsive or not, that's uh, would um, continue to be able to participate in this process. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And uh, any other third party bidder or any other bidder could also submit proposals within that time frame. That's correct. And those uh, entities who have already submitted bids would be offered an opportunity to either stand pat with what they have or uh, supplement that bid with additional information. That's correct. Very good. Mr. Englander, all the way through. When's the next council day for this? What could be the when could this be in council? Come to council. The next council meeting on for scheduling of this item? Yes. This item, yes. We can schedule this item on the Tuesday coming up. Which a week be, from tomorrow. Oh, do you want to do it that quickly? Yeah. yeah we, we're we're doing better, yeah. Do it on a special. You can also do it on a special, right? Yes, we can schedule it for um, the Wednesday meeting because the Tuesday we would need the twenty four hours. So the Wednesday meeting? Wednesday. A Wednesday meeting, a week from no, this no, no the twenty fifth. This Wednesday, two days from now. And that meets your requirements, Mr. Chavarria. If it's done as a special meeting, yeah. yes. Very good. That being said, any other comment? We need a second to that motion, which we'll have written, Mr. Koretz. We're all okay. So uh, we all vote. Roll call vote. Mr. Rosendahl. Let's hear the motion. And we'll vote. All right. Very good. To restate the motion, Mr. City Clerk. The motion was to reissue um, the, the RFP as soon as possible, correct? Yes. Correct. And with the additional requirements stated? Yes, that um, the proposal submitting can be, uh, the, promotion, the proposals that were already submitted can, um, would be available for this process. And that, um, that the current um, people that have already submitted can um, either stand pat with what they have or they could um, add additional um, information. That's right. a technical legal term. Technical, by the way. right. And, 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 sorry. And, <laughs> as, well as, as well as that the proposals that are currently submitted uh, be kept confidential. Right. That's, that's, in the interest of the event. Okay. And that, we provided for a 30-day window for response, uh, either window. supplemental responses or additional responses from, from non-bidding from parties that had not previously bid. Great. Very good. You know that. So, uh, any of Mr. Englander? Mr. Koretz? Yes. I just wanted to be clear that the 30 days is from the date that the council takes approved. action. Yes. The day after. The date within 24 hours of that. Correct. The 30 day period begins within 24 hours of the council's action? We will, we will reissue the RFP the next working day. Very good. And it's 30 days from the issuance, the yeah. reissuance of the RFP. Correct. Very good. Uh, no objection. No objection, no objection. So it's unanimous. I thank everybody for their participation today. We move this forward. Uh, thank you very much. And this joint committee is 
complete, but the Finance Committee, I'm going to turn over now to Mr. Kokori. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Labange. Mr. Buscaino, thank you. Thank you.